Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Now, one of the places that we see in Scripture that is so wonderful in this area is Philippians 3, 10 through 14. Paul starts out by saying, it is my determined purpose to know him. Not to know about him, but to know him. And to become progressively more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. And he goes on and on. This is a pretty long scripture in the Amplified. And he says, that I might come to know the power that flows out from his resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm in the body. That's a wonderful piece of scripture because Paul is saying, look, I'm determined to find this place where no matter what's going on around me, I can experience this resurrection power where I'm lifted above it mentally, emotionally. I'm lifted above it so I can still enjoy my journey even though I may have some pressing circumstances in my life. And then in the next verse, I guess if I want to read the next verse, I need to get to Philippians, not Peter. <laughs> the next verse, he says, that if possible, I might attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm in the body. Not that I have now already attained this. He said, I've not arrived. I'm not there yet. It's not a shame to say you're not there yet. Nor have I already been made perfect, but I what? Yeah. What? Yeah. But I press on to lay hold of and grasp and make my own that for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold of me and made me his own. I love, 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 love that scripture. Because here's what it's saying. Look, Jesus died for us for a reason. He took hold of us and paid the price for our sins. And took the punishment that we deserve. So we could know God and know who we are in God. And know the power that's available to us as believers in Christ. And Paul said, I'm determined to take hold of those things that Christ Jesus died for me to take hold of. You know what he was saying? I am determined to be all that God wants me to be. To have all that God wants me to have and to do all that God wants me to do. Don't ever be satisfied to be halfway between two places. Not maybe the total mess you once were, but not really truly living in victory. Say, I'm gonna press. Now you better say it with a little more gusto than that. Verse 13. I do not consider, brethren, that I've captured it and made it my own. Love this, but one thing I do, <laughs> it is my one goal, my one aspiration, my one determination, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, pressing forward to what lies ahead. We've all got a past, but you can't let the sorrows of the past ruin your present or your future. Your future has no place in it for your past except what you can learn from it. We can learn things from our past to do, we can learn things not to do, and we need to take those things with us. But if you've made mistakes in the past, which we all have, if you've been hurt in the past, which we all have, you have to come to a place where you let that past be the past. And you decide that every day, is a brand new day. And then he goes on one more time. Verse 14, I press toward the goal. So in three of those four verses, Paul says, I press, I press, I press, I press, I press. We got to press to be on that narrow path. We have to press to get the wrinkles out of our life. We have to press through all the things that try to crowd Christ out of our life to get through and take hold of the hem of his garment. And pressing is not a bad thing. It's not like, oh, bummer, I didn't come here to find out how hard life could be. I wanted to come in here and have her tell me how things could be made easier. 
Well, the way things will be made easier is when you press through the opposition you have now and you come out into a new level of freedom. That's the way life becomes easier. You don't just keep trying to make it through life with all your baggage tied to you and carry these heavy burdens. God wants to exchange things. In Isaiah 61, one through three verses that brought me through many, many difficult times, he talks about giving you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So it sounds to my, like, me like he's saying, I'm gonna take all the bad stuff from your past and I'm gonna give you better stuff for the future. Does that sound good to anybody? Now, I want to talk to you for a moment about expectation. I think sometimes that we just kind of get into this attitude, this passive attitude of waiting to see what God's going to do. And I don't think He wants us to be passive. I think He wants us to have an aggressive attitude. Matter of fact, I'm sure you all probably think that I'm a pretty aggressive lady, but I tell you what, God just told me last week, I want you to be more aggressive in your spirit. It's not about getting out and being aggressive with people. It's about aggressive, being aggressive in your spirit to say, I, you know, I am anointed by God. God's hand is on my life. I'm going to do whatever He wants me to do. I'm expecting something marvelous to happen in my life today. I can hardly wait to get this day started to see what wonderful thing that God does for me today. We need to live with that kind of expectation, but Satan wants us to live with evil forebodings. Well, we have this vague thing out here waiting for the next problem <laughs> or disaster. King David said, what, what, what would have become of me had I not believed that I would see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living? Not just when I go to heaven and get my mansion. Hey, I'm excited about heaven, but don't be the kind of Christian who always just talks about just trying to barely make it through this mean old world till you can get to your mansion in the sky. If that's all it was about, the minute you got saved, God would have beamed you out of here. And <laughs> you're here for a purpose. There's a reason for you. You're not here just to take up space. <laughs> you know, everybody in life experiences loss. And loss is not an easy thing to deal with, so I need to talk to you about it tonight. First of all, there's times when we actually lose people that we love. They die, the Lord takes them before we want them to go. And that's a very difficult thing to go through. I've walked through that with different friends that I've had, and, and it's very difficult. It's probably the worst kind of loss that you can experience. So we'll just put that one out there first and let me say that if that's happened to you or anybody watching by TV, I have not personally had that experience, but I know that it must be tragically terrible. However, even in that, there will come a time when you will have to make a decision that you are going to go ahead and celebrate the life that you have left and trust God with that terrible thing that you just don't understand. I'm telling you what, trust in God is the most beautiful thing that I have ever seen in my, I mean, it is just, Trusting God is the greatest benefit that we have as believers. How wonderful it is not to have to understand everything. Oh my gosh, what peace of mind to not have to figure everything out and have a reason for everything. My goodness, we need to get comfortable not knowing. Huh? I don't know, but I'm happy. <laughs> but there are many kinds of loss. 
To fail at anything is a loss. A relationship that didn't work, a business that didn't succeed, a diet that didn't work, <laughs> an exercise program that you never followed through on. I know you got the elliptical machine, the bike, the treadmill, the, you know, some of you got enough equipment to start your own gym. <laughs> you buy all the machines on TV that you can just wear on your body and the fat's going to just fade away overnight. <laughs> The world is always offer us some, offering us something where we can get this amazing benefit with no effort. Grow up. I mean, if you just want to send somebody your money, send it to me. Don't keep sending it to them. Because at least I will tell you the truth. There is no pill you can take that is going to melt fat. And there is no machine that you can just pin to your body and overnight it's just going to work everything. And I love the ads, with no effort whatsoever to you. Garbage. You may not like everything I say, but at least I'm telling you the truth. Amen. If you ate too much for three years, now you're going to have to go hungry for a while. <laughs> if you spent too much money and you got a lot of credit card debt, you're going to have to not buy stuff <laughs> for maybe a long time to get out of debt. Joyce, I wish you'd go on to something else. Many times we get stuck in our sin. You know, that's a failure. We feel like we failed God. And I think that that's probably one of the hardest areas for Christians. No wonder Paul said, I've not arrived at perfection. One thing I do, though, I let go of yesterday's mistakes and I press on. You know, you cannot make spiritual progress today if you enter today feeling guilty about yesterday. Amen? Some of you have been stuck. And God sent me here to get you unstuck. You've been stuck in the same place for way too long, mourning and grieving over something that you can't do anything about. But let me tell you something, you've got a lot of life left. And if God didn't have anything left for you, then you wouldn't be here. When he's done with us, we'll go. So if you're here and you're breathing, God has a purpose for you and something for you to do. And we need you. You play a part that only you can do, and you're important. That's right. I think if you stay sad too long, it's going to make you mad. I think sad becomes mad. You know why? Because we're not wired by God for sadness. We're wired for joy. The Bible doesn't say the sadness of the devil will give you strength. It says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Why does sadness eventually make us mad? Because it's not right. It's not the way we're supposed to be. We inherently know inside that we're supposed to enjoy this journey and that everything is not supposed to be a problem all the time. And so then we begin to get mad because life is out of order. And then what happens when you get mad? You start to blame other people. So now you're sad, mad, and hard to get along with. And I'm not happy because you're not doing this. And I'm not happy because you're not doing that. And I'm not happy because I hate my job. And I'm not happy, and I'm not happy, and I'm not happy because really the truth is I'm just mad. And I'm mad because I'm sad. I'm still living in the past instead of letting go of all that junk and pressing on to the good things that God has ahead. So what if you tried 10 things and failed? Yeah, you're not a failure until you stop trying. You know, I tried to go on television about 10 years before God put me on TV. 
Sometimes you've got a little itch down in here and it's something that God's really putting in there, but you're way out of God's timing. We all step out ahead of time sometimes. Sadly, some people step out and if it don't work, then they all just... Better not try that again. Don't want to look like a fool. Well, in six months, I got one piece of mail being on TV. I was on TV six months, got one piece of mail. <laughs> one. And of all things, I was trying to have a talk show where I was trying to interview guests, you know, and I've gotten a little better at that, but I, uh, I took some of the girls in, in my office and we went to some cable station in St. Louis and rented some space and we sat down to do our interview show and I would ask them questions and then I would answer them. <laughs> and they would just sit there and look at me the whole time and I mean, I would do, I'd ask, ask all the questions and I'd give all the answers. <laughs> Why didn't it work? It wasn't what God wanted me to do. But that didn't mean I give up. So the next time then when, when we really felt like God was speaking to us, I didn't say, oh my God, I ain't trying that again. I tried that 10 years ago and you know what a mess that was. You can fail your way to success. Did you hear me? I said, you can fail your way to success. You know, ivory soap was a mistake. Did you know that? That wasn't at all what they were trying to make. Nobody knew it was going to float, and then it became a miracle. A bar of soap that floats. Now millions of people, billions have bought it. I think Edison said that he had 2,000 failed experiments before he found electricity. <laughs> 2,000 failed experiments. You know, God in the Bible puts limits on mourning. Did you know that? People didn't get to mourn as long as they wanted to. I don't think that people should stay in recovery their whole life. <laughs> Some people are 70 and they're still recovering <laughs> from something that happened when they were three. <laughs> you know, I know God's not always quick, but he ain't that slow. I think he moves along a little faster than that. <laughs> well, let's just look at something that is amazing to me. In Joshua chapter 1, I find another very interesting thing. After the death of Moses, this is verse 1, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, Moses' minister, now Joshua was the man who ministered to Moses. He was with him all the time. And God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Well, what an odd statement. He already knew that. But he was making an emphatic point. He said, so now arise, get up, take his place, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land which I am giving to them. And every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I already given unto you. And I love that. God's just basically saying, I've already got your life planned out. I've already got your victory planned out. But you got to go take it. You got to possess the land. You got to get moving. You can't just sit around and cry and be sad over something that you can't do anything about anymore. You've got to get moving. And every place on which the sole of your foot treads, everything you press into, that I have already given unto you. Isn't this exciting? I think this is marvelous. And I don't know how God does it, but 
because he's God, he can do anything he wants to. And God doesn't work on our math or on our alphabet. So even if you manage to totally mess up plan A for your life, God can take plan B and make it better than plan A ever would have been. And that gives us so much hope. You know, Saul failed as king, and Samuel had put a lot of time, the prophet Samuel had put a lot of time into Saul. He was the one that anointed him. He prayed for him. He prophesied to him. And when Saul really messed up royally and disobeyed God, and God lifted his anointing off of him, and he told Saul that he was not going to be king anymore. Let's look at 1 Samuel 16, 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? Wow. Seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, fill your horn with oil, and I will send you to Jesse, Jesse the Bethlehemite. Watch this. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. So what I get out of that is God is saying, how long are you going to mourn over this thing that didn't work out? I've got a new plan. You get it? How long are you going to mourn over this thing that didn't work out? I've got a new plan. And you know, really, in God's economy, nothing is ever wasted. I think a lot of times we look back, well, you know, I worked for that place for 20 years, and I thought I was going to retire there, and then they kicked me out the door and didn't even appreciate me, and now I've just wasted all those years. No, not really, because in God's economy, He gathers up all the fragments that nothing be wasted. After He did the miracle of the fish and the loaves, He said, gather up the fragments. And actually what they ended up with was more than what they started with. And so if you'll give God the fragments of your life, your losses, your disappointments, your failures, your past sins, everything that has hurt you and wounded you, your rejections, your betrayals, if you'll give Him all of that, even though it might look and feel to you right now like a fragmented mess, God will take those things and He'll make miracles out of them. God will do something amazing in your life if you'll live with a holy, bold expectation that something good is going to happen, not because you deserve it, but because God is good. I tell God every day, I don't deserve any good thing. I'm not even asking you to be good to me because I dare to think that I deserve it. I know that I do not. But I am going to live expectantly because that's what puts a smile on your face. God is looking for somebody that He can bless. He's looking for somebody that He can use, somebody that He can work through. And it's got to be somebody that's going to believe what the Word says. Let's, let's talk again just for a minute about Saul, and then I'll finish up with, with that thought. You know, Samuel was very disappointed about what Saul did. You know, it's very hard when you pour a lot of yourself and a lot of time and effort into someone else, a child, a marriage, a friendship, and they just do something super dumb. I can honestly say that I think that probably most of my grief, when I have it, is over some dumb thing that somebody else did that I'm just like, I cannot believe that you did that. I would have never thought that you would have done that. Well, I've lived long enough now that I'm getting to the point where I'm not too surprised about anything anymore. But we have to stop, now listen to me, we have to stop letting other people's bad choices steal our joy. Now, if you're still grieving over some bad choice that somebody else made that you love and care about, I know it may not be easy. I don't mean it to sound hard-hearted, but you are not helping them by being sad. You stay sad, you're going to get mad. 
You get mad, you're going to blame. I believe God wants to bring light into that darkness tonight. You pray for them. You be an example when you're around them. You don't ever give up on them. But you don't let their bad choice ruin your life. Are you hearing me tonight? You don't let their bad choice ruin your life. Well, today I've been speaking to you about pressing in and pressing on, and I know that sometimes that is not the most exciting thing to think about. But I want to encourage you that it is well worth it when you get to the other side of the things that you're dealing with now. I want to encourage you not to give up there are new things that God is doing, and He wants you to press into them. The enemy wants to hold you back in the past, but God wants you to press into the new. Make a commitment that you're never going to quit, and you're not going to give up.